I hope you enjoy yourselves this evening and I hope everyone's been having a good day so far. Um, just as we're letting people join in, if you want to say hi and let us know where you're from, you can um, type that into the comment section. Um, if uh, you have any questions, um, if you have technical questions, I will answer them in the chat. If you have questions for Jean, we're going to hold those till the end of the presentation, but you can put your questions in the chat as they come up and I'll make sure that she answers them for you. Um, I would like to um, uh, also let you know that if you ever see any links come up in the chat for a place to click on a link and join the presentation in high def or something, don't click any of those. Um, there are people that are just trying to trick you into paying for something that you don't need to pay for because this is being provided today by uh, the um, wonderful people at the Ontario Field Ornithologists. All right, so we have people from Manitowoc and Brampton and people from just down the road at Point Pelee and Lethbridge, Alberta today. Wow, this is great. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you all here. Well, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Sarah Rupert, and um, if you've been to the park before, especially during the month of May, you may have met me before. I'm kind of the girl who really likes birds at Point Pelee. I currently work as the promotion officer for the park, and one of my great and most fun responsibilities is putting together programs every spring uh, for our birding festival. And since we couldn't be together in person, um, I'm really happy and pleased that Jean was able to join us tonight and we'll get to still uh, partake in the wonderful shorebird presentation that Jean's put together for us. So, um, oh, I don't even know how long I've known Jean for now. She's just a staple in my birding life. Uh, and her passion for shorebirds is um, inspiring. And I always learn something new from Jean every time I hear her speak, every time we sit and chat about something. Um, there's always a great little nugget of information that Jean has to share with us. Um, Jean has done extensive work with shorebirds. She's been really important um, in a lot of the work that's been done along the shores of James Bay and understanding um, our numbers of shorebirds and um, in consequently um, contributing to the conservation plans for all of these birds. And I'm sure Jean will probably share a couple stories from her experiences up in the north, but she's also gonna tell us about the shorebirds that are moving through at this time of the year. And spring is a fantastic time of year to see shorebirds. And if you've ever gone out and looked at sandpipers anywhere, you may think, wow, they all look a lot alike. And from a first glance, a lot of them do, but Jean's going to help us figure it all out today. She's going to give us some really great tips and tricks. Um, I know she has some great silhouettes she's going to start us off with, and we can all make our guesses as to what we think things are. And by the end, we might even change our answers and um, have learned even more uh, inf great information about um, shorebirds as we go today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to Jean Iron, uh, someone who I'm very uh, happy to call a good friend. And um, she's going to talk to us about shorebirds tonight. And I know we are all going to learn something new. So Jean's going to start sharing her screen. I am also going to disappear so you can just see Jean while we're doing our, um, while she's doing her presentation. Um, but if you have questions, please put them in the chat and Jean will answer them at the end of the presentation. And if you're having any technical issues, you can put that in the chat too and I'll be here monitoring that as well. So I'm going to pass the, uh, the baton over to you, Jean, and we're going to get started. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to be here with all of you shorebird enthusiasts. We, set, we share the same passion for shorebirds or the wind birds as they're also known. So these birds that we love are, these wind birds are strong, marvelous flyers, averaging greater distances in their migrations than any other family of birds on earth. We love their subtle colors and their beautiful plumages. So this is an exciting time of year because our shorebirds are all in their breeding splendor. And added to these qualities are the fun and challenge of identification. 
We are well positioned here in southern Ontario to watch shorebirds as they migrate from their southern wintering areas to breed here and farther north in, the north, in northern Ontario and way up into the Arctic. So this is a perfect time to review ID points and learn some new facts. So uh, this marble godwit and uh, willet on the beach at Wheatley Harbor near Point Pelee will start us on our shorebird quest. Now, size and shape. So expert birders identify shorebirds by this general impression of size and shape. It's an impression. Uh, they do it automatically. They also quickly assess the, the bill color and shape, the leg color and length, overall size and posture. So just take, we'll just take, a, um, you know, couple of seconds or a little more. I'll give you a chance just to look at each one of them and just uh, give it a guess. Um, we're going to cover them at the end. Um, this is not a, it's a test, but it's not a test that anybody's supposed to be scared of because you, you just can't fail. All right, so we're going to do it together at the end. That's okay. Just give you an idea. These are all, some of the, we're going to cover them all in the presentation. So what we're going to cover this evening are shorebird facts about northbound migration. Breeding plumages, we're going to look at those. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about molt, maybe, and uh, and how to age. Well, that, that'll just come as part of the presentation. Uh, but throughout, the focus is going to be on the breeding plumages. Um, we, we'll look at uh, important feather tracts as well, and um, such as the scapulas, wing coverts, tertials, and primaries. Uh, we're going to cover the program uh, in, a, we'll start off in the chrono chronology of when shorebirds come back to Southern Ontario, and then we'll drift into distinctive shorebird groups, gr groupings that are, are in the same uh, families or um, are very similar. Then we will do Dowager identification, and I know you're all looking forward to that. Uh, we'll come back to our shorebird quiz, and then uh, we'll talk about shorebird hotspots. Uh, and you can think about some of your favorites and I can tell you some of mine. So what is a shorebird? Well, it's a diverse group that includes plovers, godwits, uh, medium and large uh, sandpipers, small sandpipers called peeps. Uh, then we have avocets and phalaropes, wimbrels. So these are all uh, birds that are uh, names that you're familiar with. Um, and uh, Ontario's got a very healthy uh, shorebird checklist, 52 species on the Ontario checklist. 34 of them occur regularly, and those are the ones to become uh, familiar with. And uh, because we have uh, tundra on the Hudson Bay coast of Ontario, we have uh, a good number of breeding birds, 24. So we go right from the south all the way up to uh, low Arctic conditions. And so uh, now let's take a look at the northbound migration. Um, so this shows where the shorebirds are coming from. And um, they're long distance migrants. Many of them are coming from South America, way down here. Um, and um, so they come up through uh, South America, across the Caribbean. These are the ones in the East now. Many are gonna come up the West Coast, maybe go up the center or up the Pacific Coast. The ones that we're interested in are the ones that are gonna cross the Amazon basin and the, the Caribbean and maybe stage uh, at places like Delaware Bay and on the east uh, on the, the east coast the atlantic coast uh, maybe down in florida or on the gulf coast then uh, from there many of them may just head straight up uh, into the arctic um, uh, but many of them of course breed all uh, you know all the way here in southern ontario and up through the boreal forest and 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 hudson bay lowlands 
the high Arctic breeders are coming into the Canadian Arctic from Europe and um, uh, over in the West, uh, many uh, shorebirds are coming from Asia. And as you, you know, the story of the godwits and, and shorebirds that all come all the way up from the Southern hemisphere. And uh, so here, when they come up the center here, they spread out and so our birds are spreading out as well. Okay, so um, <clears throat> points to consider about northbound migration. Well, it's rapid. Unlike the leisurely fall southbound migration, shorebirds are in a hurry to reach breeding grounds. So uh, the, many of them will ju just be going straight through. Uh, they don't linger. They may stop to rest, uh, but many hardly stop even to feed. Now, some species use staging areas uh, such as Delaware Bay to fatten up. Uh, for example, the red knots coming up, or the, the ruddy turnstones coming up from uh, South America. And so these staging areas are important. The birds actually stay there uh, maybe three weeks, even to a month at a time. And um, there are two waves. So the adults older than one year come first. These are the breeding uh, birds. So they're going to come first to get the breeding territories. Uh, then year old birds generally come later. And some of these um, uh, may not even be in full breeding plumage. Now, some year old birds, especially the larger ones, uh, such as Wimbrel, they actually summer on the wintering grounds and they don't breed until they're the, ne the next year uh, around. So um, we don't, there are some shorebirds we don't see it, many of them in their first summer plumage. All right, um, so it's important to know uh, some of the feather tracks, particularly the, the ones that are used for shorebird identification. So here we have a breeding plumage dunlin and um, it's showing the feathers that we want to talk about very nicely. And so um, we have the primaries here. These are the, the main uh, flight feathers. These are the ones, the wing, these are the wing feathers. And so uh, they're the main out of flight feathers. We want to know whether they extend beyond the tail. Are they worn or fresh? And so, um, Always be sure to note the length of, of the primaries and um, they're generally black like this. So um, then the, we want to look at, oops, we want to look at the tertials. And this feather here is, the ter is one of the tertials. And uh, very often, th these are the three inner secondaries of, of the flight feathers. And they're generally long, colorful feathers. And so they're sitting on the tail here. And uh, they're very, a very important set of feathers on shorebirds uh, because they usually, or they very often have a distinctive pattern. And so we wanna pay attention to the pattern. So on this bird, it's black, got a black center with a rufous um, border outline on the outside. And then the scapulars are these, um, these large, um, patterned feathers uh, that drape over the wing. And here you can see the just the beautiful subtle patterns um, in the scapulas. And again, it's important to pay attention uh, to those patterns. And then on the wing here, we have the wing coverts. And um, on this particular Dunlin, you can see they are extremely worn. And that is because they're older feathers that molted in last fall. And uh, you'll notice this on many shorebirds that this will be typical of many that they that's part of the wing and they don't molt it when they're molting into the breeding plumage but all these other bright colorful feathers are the breeding plumage all right and uh so now uh here we have we're going into the chronology right now and uh we have a very familiar bird this is um an one of the early migrants. It's easily identified by voice before you even see them. So the Kildia arrived back in uh, mid-March and are on the nest 
late April to early May in Southern Ontario. And um, it, it, you look for the, they're, they're so distinctive with the two rings around the neck and uh, you see them in parking lots, they're, they're very common. Um, and here, uh, maybe already you have baby killdeer uh, running around in your area. I know when I go to Point Pelee, I'm always flabbergasted that um, uh, down, you know, down in southwestern Ontario, the killdeer have hatched maybe even uh, the middle of May. And um, the photo on the right here is actually the killdeer that hatched off the visitor center roof uh, several years ago. So Kildia are among the first. Another really early one is the American uh, woodcock. They arrive back in late March. And another name for it is the woodland sandpiper. It's a sandpiper of young woodlands with open soft ground nearby where they probe for eat earthworms. And they're still displaying now because in Toronto here uh, about oh, last week, um, they were, even in a, on a cool night, the, they were still displaying pink thing on the ground, flying up, whirling up, and, and then tweet, 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 as they came down. So a note uh, for identification, the direction of the stripes on the head. So woodland sandpiper. And um, I couldn't help be amazed when Rick MacArthur, who lives at Rondo Provincial Park or near the, you know, in that area, in, right up there, um, put a, these photos of American woodcock, uh, little tiny chicks on Facebook, 21st of April, 2021. And that's when we had that big snow, you know, that, it, that week it was, it was almost like Arctic conditions in Southern Ontario. Anyway, I just hope these little ones uh, survived. Uh, there were four of them. So just shows you um, how early uh, the, the shorebirds are coming back, some of them. Now, pectoral sandpiper is another uh, uh, early April uh, uh, shorebird that returns here and this is the longest distance migrant of all American shorebirds. The birds that breed in Siberia travel 30,000 kilometers return trip over the Canadian Arctic to South America and uh, so this this again is an example of the unbelievable migrations that these sandpipers uh, uh, undertake. They, they're called the bib sandpiper because they have this very dramatic uh, bib here in front and uh, yellowish, le yellow legs and yellow at the base of the bill. And anyway, uh, they've been back here for a while. And Wilson snipe, um, called the swamp sandpiper uh, because they breed in uh, marshes and wet fields, flat, really wet fields. Uh, that's the area they like. Um, this photo was taken on the Cardinal Bar that many of you know, taken in early April. And uh, they just love to stand on fence posts right beside the road. Now these were, are already uh, winnowing and displaying. And so the winnowing that you hear when they're flying around above ooh, um, is caused by the air rushing through their outer tail feathers. And greater yellow legs. Uh, this photo was taken in, at Minnesing Swamp, McKinnon Road, uh, back in mid-April, where they, and again, um, here's a shorebird that comes back early, beautiful, bright, yellow legs and take a look at the shape um, of the bill here. It's long, it's thick, um, generally sort of a greenish gray at the base and um, heavily barred on the, the chest here. There are always a lot of questions. Is this a greater or is this a lesser? Well, you look at the, look at the, the bill, also the size, but if you only have one bird, it's a little difficult. But you know automatically that this one here um, is a greater by the amount. Take a look at the front here by the amount of uh, barring on the front. 
And uh, it's also got a distinctive white eye ring. Okay, but definitely look for that barring all the way to the legs. And here, um, the lesser yellow legs arrive uh, a little later, maybe mid-April. And um, well, generally after, it's usually the greater yellow legs that are reported first. And of course, smaller, shorter bill, straighter, and uh, fine breast and flank markings. This is it, but it's all white uh, in this area here where the greater yellow legs um, has got lots of patterning. And now we're looking a little later, late April, early May. These are only approximate dates because, you, you know, you get birds that come in earlier or maybe some years they, they start to come back a little later. And here we have solitary sandpaper. And like its name suggests, they're often uh, just by themselves or uh, with a couple of other birds. I, I certainly have never seen a flock of solitary sandpipers. It looks like the yellow legs and it bobs too, like the yellow legs, they bob up and down. So, um, but the, the legs are greenish yellow as opposed to the bright yellow of the yellow legs. And it's got a prominent eye ring, yellow at the base of the bill and spotted all over here. Um, so look for those, the spots. Now, this is the only New World sandpiper that nests regularly in trees. So there's a, a fact for you. Uh, you may or may not have owned it, uh, known it before. And they do like flooded uh, woods, edges of marshes, and sewage lagoons. Um, this photo was taken on the Woodland Trail um, in May at Point Pelee. Uh, so Dunlin, very easy to recognize when they have that nice uh, dark uh, black uh, belly patch and they're reddish on the back. Uh, and you notice the individual variation in this photo here. Some are much um, more, much redder than others. And the old name for this sandpiper was Redback Sandpiper. Now, um, and again, here you'll see a variation because those wing covets I showed you um, are variable and now some of them may even be molted. Uh, but anyway, uh, here they are. They're, they're in all, ki all kinds of areas where you'll find shorebirds. They, they pop up, they show up. Now we're going to try some videos and uh, Sarah here is, um, has, is doing wonders, I, I think, with videos I sent her. So Sarah, this is for um, the video of... All right, the, I'll get it started for you. Good. And here you check this one Dublin who is, um, who is a very cheeky one, as you will see when you get it going. But um, we'll, Dunlin actually, they, they come in and they're here probably over the longest stretch of the migration. They come in fairly early and um, there will be some right way towards the end of the, the, the migration time. So anyway. All right. We got to see that video. Did you see it? Yep. Okay, then I guess, all right, so let's, I'll go on now to the next, tell me when it's finished because I'm not seeing it, I'm just seeing my slide. Yeah, it's all done. Oh, good, all right, thank you. All right, and um, so be sure to look for super rarities like this curlew sandpiper on the left, a vagrant from Eurasia, and they travel amongst the Dunlin. So it's bright red with a slender decurved bill. And so if you see one in bright breeding plumage like this, please call or text me right away. Doesn't matter where you are. I want to know about it, please. 
anyway so um but th that's how that's how you'll find the rarities is looking amongst the the common birds and knowing the common birds really well so now we'll touch on some spring dowager identification is this a long build or a short build dowager i know you we can't hear your responses um well it's a long bill dowager at hillman marsh point near point peely and um so and the rule is a dowager in april is probably a long bill dowager and that's when of course this photo was taken and it's easier to identify dowagers when they're in breeding plumage because uh, you can identify them by the field marks, by the, the feathers. And uh, you're not relying on, oh, well, it looks hunchback or it doesn't, or it's got a long bill or a short bill. Uh, those are uh, fallible identification markers. So this is a typical long bill dowager in breeding plumage. And the main confusion is with our Hendersoni subspecies of short bill dowager. And so it's got the darker upper parts here that are with, uh, with feathers that are edged in white. And it's got heavy flanks uh, streaking here. Also, the dark feathers are edged in white, very heavily spotted here in front of the wing and across the neck. And I'm going to put on another photo and we're going to look at those identification features here as well. So, and you see, this is a, a long bill dowager, but the bill on this doesn't look very long. So um, that's why you can't use bill length to identify dowagers with any precision. Uh, but again, you look here at the, the flank feathers and their edge there, it's well marked, big, nice marks on the flanks, uh, edged in white, very heavily spotted here and marked in front of the wing, and it's uh, marks and spots in front of the wing and heavily spotted across the neck. And it's very often they have the, this grayish look about them. And of course, big white edges on the feathers on, on the back. The, the red goes all the way to the undertail coverts here. All right, so now here is the Henderson Eye uh, short bill dowager. This is the, mo the most uh, common subspecies of short bill dowager that we get in Southern Ontario, well, I and in Ontario. Uh, it's more orange on the on the underparts here, and it go, they go right to the undertail covert. Okay, um, it's also got a variable number of bars on the side here, and but the key is that right in here, in front of the bend in the wing, uh, it's lightly marked and very lightly spotted compared to long bill dowager um on on the neck here so this is the this is the key area to look for right in front of the bend in the wing let's look at another one here's another typical or it's typical that you you're seeing individual variation but again right here in front of the bend in the wing uh it's very lightly marked compared to the long build and look how lightly spotted it is across the neck. There's no, uh, just no comparison between this and a long build dowager, how heavily spotted they are. Um, and again, another Henderson eye uh, from a different angle, but again, showing how lightly spotted this one is on the neck and in the bend of the wing. Um, so here's one from, again, a different angle, and we're going to bring up now um, a long bill dowager. And there it is, the same sort of angle. You can see how heavily barred and marked it is in the bend of the wing and how heavily spotted it is all across the neck here. So those are the, some of the key points to look for. And of course, read up, look at photos and uh, test yourselves on it. 
Now, the, that photo of the long billed doucher is interesting because it shows the prehensile tip. Um, and all shorebirds have a, a very soft tip to their bill, and that enables them to probe in the mud. And it, it's also very sensitive, and so they can uh, pull out, you know, all the juicy food that they're looking for. The, um, okay, so here's another video, Sarah, of uh, just to show a uh, Henderson eye short billed outcher. I uh, noticed all the light spotting and in front of the wing. Okay, I'm gonna just pull this up. Can everyone see this? I just wanna get a, I'm gonna just take the zoom off and we're gonna play the video now and hopefully everyone can see it this time. Oh. Lots of thumbs up and greats and perfect. So good. Oh, great. The other okay, video so didn't you... play as well, but we'll play it again at the end, just so everyone right. knows. All right. And though that one was good, they saw that juicy snack. Yes. Or that's uh, that. <laughs> All right. Great. And now this uh, is one of the subspecies of a short bill dowager that could cause a little bit of confusion with long bill dowager. Uh, because uh, this is the grissiest short bill dowager, and we call it the Quebec dowager. And uh, I'll show you why uh, in a minute. Um, well, it breeds in Quebec and migrates from South America up the East Coast, and, the, and, and so they breed almost entirely in Quebec. We do get a few as they pass through in Southern Ontario, especially in Eastern Ontario. And it's not as orange, but you see, look how pale it is here, um, whereas long billed dowichers will all be red all the way in, because they'll all be in breeding plumage. Um, and so, yes, it could be a little confusing because it is, um, it's, uh, it is spotted on the neck as well. So, um, but it's definitely more barred and spotted than Henderson eye. Okay, and so we've been talking about the subspecies of, of uh, short billed dowager. Carinus is the West Coast one, um, and actually the word Carinus means of the West Wind. Henderson eye is the, the, the bird that breeds, the subspecies that breeds in Ontario and all across the prairies, here in the northern prairies, and then Grisius primarily in Quebec. And so our, most of our birds will be Henderson eye, except in Eastern Ontario, where as you can, you can see just geographically, uh, the Grisius is gonna be coming up from the Atlantic coast and crossing over. Okay, so now let's take a look at um, the plovers and we'll start with the American golden plover with this striking black face and neck and uh, the, the whole belly and undertail. Are, um, are are black and um and this lovely white shawl wraps up and around and they meet over the eye so um i've put this one in first because the uh, the, the the american golden plovers come back earlier than black-bellied plovers and in breeding plumage there's not so much of a of a an identification challenge so this is a, a male and and also a nice slender bill on them as well and and they do have this golden look on the back okay we looked at that and and this is actually a female this is up on uh, the hudson bay coast of of ontario they breed in ontario on the tundra and uh, you can see how um, sort of uh, splotchy the black is, speckled, sort of what you've got a lot of white uh, splotches on it. But these birds undertake huge migrations uh, from South America to their uh, Arctic and subarctic uh, breeding grounds. 
and uh, some actually some of the longest migrations on earth with extensive flights over water. Now, um, anybody who goes to Point Pelee knows about the uh, American golden plovers uh, on, the, on the agricultural fields down in southwestern Ontario. And it's an absolute treat to see you know, many hundreds of them at a time uh, at times. So um, also, I guess, agricultural fields in other parts uh, of Ontario, but mainly down in the southwest, because this is what we call an elliptical migrant. They're coming up from South America, but we only get the uh, outer east side of them, of the flocks, because they're going to the to their main breeding areas through the center of the continent. And here's a black-bellied plover, and very distinctive. Uh, this is a male, and uh, it shows a whiter crown, and it, it's paler on the back, really nicely uh, well-patterned, dramatic colored changes. And um, it got a black face. Now, the key identification mark here to look for uh, is the white undertail. And... Um, so let's take a look at the, oops, there we go. <laughs> and uh, again, they come in in huge flocks, um, as, especially down, again, down in southwestern Ontario. So in the, on the edges of marshes and uh, just uh, lots of places. In fact, uh, uh, they're on rock jetties and the tip of Point Pelee, just like, like the, this was when the water came right up to the end of Point Pelee. Um, and here is a flight shot showing the underwing. And you can see uh, the, the black underwing. That American golden plover does not have that black in the, on the underwing. And it's an underwing. It's not armpits. Birds don't have arms. So just think of that. It's, an un, it's on their underwing. And so, Sarah, we are going to go now with another video. Excellent. This is at the tip of Point Keeley, but this, is, this happened one day. Hundreds of them came across Lake Erie, and they literally, Point Keeley is the first uh, tip of land that they've seen. And boy, were they happy to see it. They swirled around several times, uh, but I hope the video's coming and you can see them as they started to land on the tip. Yes, excellent. All right. Is it? Yeah, we're good to go, Jean. Thank you. Okay. Oh, oh mine's going too. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, and now we have semi-palmated plover. This is another one of the plovers. It's a chunky, small plover. You can see the, the chunky uh, size with uh, black facial markings and one black uh, collar here. Um, and now the female markings are paler. And it's called semi-palmated because there are semi-palmations or partial webbing between the toes down here on the feet. So semi-palmated plover. Um, the, another plover that looks very similar and uh, probably all of you are familiar too with uh, the, the piping plover. This was one of the piping plovers that was at Point Pelee in 2019. And of course, every year there, uh, there there's a piping plover. And um, we always want to know because all of them or just about all of them have uh, have bands where this one was from. And so Andrea Grass says this bird you may already know uh, was one of the chicks that pledged from Toronto Island in 2018. And uh, anyway, there. So that was the year before. This was in 2019, and there it is. And thanks to Mark Peck uh, for the photo. That is the uh, little when it was a little baby on the Toronto Islands. And the 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 so the way to be sure you're identifying piping plover from semi palmated plover. Roger Tory Peterson said that the back color of piping plover is the same color as dry beach sand and 
of semi-palmated plover, it is of wet beach sand. And there you see the color right there. Now, um, I took a trip, quick trip last week out to Darlington Provincial Park. They, uh, they have a marvelous setup for piping plovers. There were five of them there, two returning from last year. And then overnight, uh, three others had come in and there was quite uh, some battle going on over territory when, when Ron Pittaway and I were there watching them uh, with the, with the uh, person who's in charge. Monica. And they've got a wonderful area all roped off because this is an endangered species. So Darlington, Wasega Beach, they're in provincial parks and they've got full protection from uh, parking and uh, certainly Sobo Beach, they put up exposures as well. Another video. Okay, you're back on, Jane. All right. And just beware, too, piping plovers uh, can also not have um, a, a neck band. Uh, some the females, well, winter plumage, and first year birds uh, don't, don't necessarily have a full neck band. So be sure to check out anyone you see very carefully for the very rare in Ontario snowy plover. Um, the snowy plover, though, has an all black, little all black bill there and uh, black legs or grayish, sort of grayish legs. Piping plovers, you can see the color there. And Wilson's plover is another super rarity for Ontario. Uh, again, check very carefully uh, the bill. Uh, this one was in Hamilton um, many years ago now, but uh, definitely check for, for that. Now, large spectacular shorebirds, uh, we all love seeing these. Um, we, the um, these long-legged, they got spectacular plumages, uh, long and long bills. And uh, on this uh, American Avocet, you can see the, distingu the, the distinctive uh, cinnamon wash on the head and neck and the dramatic black and white wings. And so it's regular in Ontario now, even though it doesn't breed here and they swish their bills back and forth to feed. You can actually tell males from females, uh, but do it with caution. Uh, the one on the left, the male longer and straighter and female uh, is uh, shorter and slightly more upturned. And video, please, to show the motion of the, uh, of the avocets, uh, their feeding style as they swim. Very distinctive. Um, like Pili in that area and anywhere on the on, right on the lakes is good for Amazon. subspecies we get in Ontario migrating from the east coast to the prairies where it breeds on fresh water in the prairie wetlands and it's frequent at Point Pelee and uh, at the, uh, that sort of on on Lake Erie we also get get them on Lake Ontario and um, but the eastern willet is confined to the Atlantic coast where it breeds on salt water so we're getting the ones uh, that are going to, to be on fresh water. And it really should probably should be um, a separate species uh, like the Dowichers, but um, it, they haven't, they sort of haven't come around to that yet. Uh, but uh, here's a good example of the markings, the, um, the, the color of the bill with the sort of pale grayish at the base, nice patterning on the front with a bit of a pinky uh, tinge to it. And so this is when Willets look their most dramatic is when they lift their wings and you see that gorgeous pattern. And um, so we're going to see them now, Sarah, please. 
and uh, here we go. Look for them lifting their wings. It's absolutely gorgeous. Excellent. We saw all those great wing flashes. Okay, good. All right. And now we're going on to Marble Godwit, one of my favorite shorebirds. And the main breeding population is on the prairies. And they do breed in Ontario uh, at Rainy River. And then we have the outlier population on the west coast and, and south, uh, just slightly southeast coast of James Bay and Onagamski Island. And um, this is a large shorebird, gorgeous, uh, subtle colors, long bill, and here with a nice uh, sort of uh, pinky or orange uh, at the base. And again, a shorebird, when it raises its wings, you go, wow, look at those uh, fabulous colors. And um, here's another video just showing them walking around. You may even be able to hear them. I think in some of these videos, you can, you can actually hear the vocalizations. Uh, but um, females have a longer bill than males, and it's generally pink at the base. So uh, the males are more orange. But um, Okay, and just to tell you about Marble Godwit migration, um, I, I actually helped put a transmitter on on James Bay up here, um, and the, when they were, everybody believed that the James Bay Marble Godwits spent the winter down here on the East Coast and in, Flo in Florida, Georgia and Florida, the Carolinas. But they were flabbergasted when they found that they went over to uh, Baja and the here in right in here in the bay. So uh, this is what's happening. The um, these birds that are down here in the winter in the Carolinas, Georgia, and Florida, they put satellite transmitters on them, and they went across and to the prairies, and that's where they breed. And these are the ones that are passing by Point Pili at the end of April and early May. The birds from uh, uh, Mexico, from Baja, they are the ones that went to James Bay. And they don't leave down there until maybe the third, yes, it's the third week. It's about the 20th of May that they leave because there's no point in them going up to James Bay uh, until the third week of May because it's still uh, they're still too cold and too icy and habitats not opened up. And black neck stilts, another gorgeous shorebird. Uh, uh, Hillman Marsh and that area is about the best place um, I think to see them in southern Ontario and uh, a breeder in that area. Now Hudsonian Godwit, um, this is a male in breeding plumage, and these are a very rare northbound migrant. Um, this bird is, uh, is coming up from South America. It's a real long distance migrant, and they're another of those elliptical migrants that goes up the center of the continent to their breeding areas in the Arctic, and then they'll swing east when they uh, go south after breeding. And there's just another showing uh, the, the bright red. This was actually taken at Hillman Marsh. But uh, another spectacular shorebird that we all love to see. And Wimbrel, well, um, I love Wimbrel too, and I'm sure you do. And uh, there's uh, lots of opportunity to see them. Uh, generally, it'll be around mid to the third week of May, they migrate in a very narrow window, uh, especially in the Toronto area where we have the Wimbrel Watch. Uh, anywhere from the 19th of May to the end of May uh, is, is the best time. Um, they migrate rapidly from the East Coast, from the Atlantic Coast, uh, and they're not feeding on migration. They just put down to rest and then they, they keep on going. And um, so it's great to look for them on the shorelines of the Great Lakes because they've been migrating all night. They leave the east, 
the East Coast um, uh, and, um, and just fly all night. And so they need a rest in the morning. And uh, this is the uh, fabulous photo of the Mat Toronto in front of the CN Tower. And Sarah, there's a video. This is one where they landed at on the beach at uh, Wheatley Harbor, and they were resting really nicely there. And then, uh, anyway, you'll see what happens in the video. Okay, I'll start it now. Yeah, great. Okay, great. And look out for uh, when you see flocks of windrows, just look out that they still may be uh, putting satellite transmitters on and it's really neat when you see them and you realize how fantastic uh, the, the results are, especially for conservation and for all of us that that we think that windrow was hope that this is the, it's a green track as she came, went from St. Croix, the U.S. Virgin Islands, all the way to a breeding grounds up in the Northwest Territories. And um, so over a span of five, nine, five, four, four uh, breeding seasons, uh, she's on 80,000 kilometers. So it's pretty remarkable and they're able to learn a lot about their migration and the threats to them over migration. So Stilt Sand Piper now is, um, is a really neat uh, in, in breeding plumage, uh, very nicely patterned, beautiful barring on the front. I love these sort of tufts on the top of the head and a rufous cheek patch, but uh, they look a little bit like a, a dull um, dowager at this time of year. And again, this is, uh, we don't see many of them because they're a long distance migrant from South America going north through the center of the continent. Upland sandpiper is the grassland sandpiper and um, anywhere where there are still the old fields or alvars and um, is a place uh, to look for them because they nest on the ground and so this is uh, on the cardinal bar again where it's curlew like call gives it away and it's got the yellow legs and um, so it's not breeding anywhere near water like uh, most of the or all of the other uh, sandpipers they're in the drier uh, much drier fields and there it is just in a clover meadow um walking around it's a it's a treat to see beautiful it's one of the big attractions on any of the alvars on the bruce peninsula um and on the cardin alvar and probably a uh, napanee as well and spotted sandpiper e uh, easy to identify they not only have they got spots but they teeter as they walk and in fact if you observe very closely, this is a pair, and um, the male has less densely spot, less dense spots than the female. Um, this is more densely spotted. Now you just have to be careful because, of course, you always get ones where you say, hmm, "I'm not sure whether that's a male or a female." So you need to see the male and the female to make a determination. And the peeps now are the smallest of the sandpipers. Um, and here is uh, Lee Sandpiper. This is the, the first peep to return um, with its distinctive yip yip call. And uh, it's, the small, it's the smallest sandpiper. In fact, it is the smallest sandpiper in the world. And um, so the legs are yellowish green. That's a, a good, very good determinant. And the bill uh, has got a little bit of a droop and it's pointy. 
Uh, but they, again, you get so much individual variation, so you do have to study all these sandpipers very carefully. Look how bright the upper parts are on this particular one compared to the other ones. And semi-palmated uh, sandpiper, they come later because of where they're going. Um, they're going much farther north to breed than the, the, the least sandpipers. And we have another video, oh, just a sec, semi-palmated, just like, oops, the, the mark is in the, oh, the, I, I, this is for the, um, the, looking at the primaries, you see where the primaries do not extend beyond the tail. And uh, so very important point. And here, the semi-palmations between the toes. But this is why, why you need to check the, the length on the primaries because of identification with this uh, sandpiper, the white rump sandpiper. And um, this peep has black legs like the semi-palmated, uh, but it's, uh, it's got patterning up here and a nice rufous streak here, a scapular line right there, and these arrowhead uh, markings on the flanks. And a nice, uh, so there's the mark to look for. The wings extend, the primaries extend beyond the tail. They extend beyond the tertials here and beyond the tail. And the other mark to look for is the orange at the base of the bill. So white rum sandpipers, they come through uh, later, because, again, because they're high Arctic breeders. So there's no point in anybody going to the Arctic too early. Uh, Western and white rumps are also, uh, Western's very rare, uh, but again, you, you have to always check all the white rumps and all the semis for a, a Western. And um, you can see, oops, sorry, i go back there. You can see uh, Westerns, they do not have a wing extension beyond the tail, right? Whereas um, the white rump does. But in many other respects, they're very similar. They also do not have uh, orange at the base of the bill. And sandling is the beached sandpiper because it, that's where it likes to be. Uh, you generally don't find them in muddy fields and um, muddy sewage lagoons. They're, they're almost always on the shoreline. And again, a lot of variation um, in their uh, in their plumages, uh, just about every, each one is different. You can identify, actually identify individuals. And again, they're coming later because they're uh, an Arctic breeder as well. well. And uh, they can be confused because of the reddish on the upper parts. Um, they could be confused uh, with, people might think, oh my gosh, I've got a rare European stint. Uh, so the arrow here is pointing, it doesn't have a hind toe, whereas all the peeps and stints have a hind toe. So that's another thing with your super uh, scopes, you check it out. Okay, and here they are on the beach. dramatic and gorgeous looking uh, sandpiper, beautiful colors and amazing patterns on ruddy turnstones. Again, an Arct high Arctic breeder, so um, there are not too many of them here yet, but they will be coming. So we've got lots to look forward to. And the males have whiter heads than the females, and they, and they tend to be uh, much brighter. And they generally come up from South America with the red knots. And so we have another video here just showing them um, on the beach. And uh, that's, an, that's a great place or on rock jetties. They really like to be uh, on, on those kinds of places. Next, we have 
out of being a rufous subspecies of the red knot. And thanks to Mark Peck for this gorgeous photo. This is a, another beautiful shorebird with, with exquisite uh, patterning in the scapulas here and of course you probably already know they are endangered uh, they're endangered uh, federally in Canada and provincially so we have a big responsibility to for red knots that pass through our area particularly James Bay uh, in the fall at least 25 20 25 percent of the world population of the rufous subspecies um, stages on our James Bay and uh, the, a good time to go out and look for shorebirds is when the weather is terrible. Do not sit at home and say, oh, it's too, it's too wet, it's too windy out there, because particularly now, from now to the end of May, when the main shorebird migration, they move during the day, and that's when they could very well put, be put down. And the video we're going to see now is them on a beach in Toronto, um, I went down because it was terrible weather, winds howling, and there on the beach were all these um, red knots. It was brilliant. So here's a look on the video. Okay. All right. And again, putting you, uh, satellite transmitters now, uh, or um, um, data loggers on shorebirds helps us, especially when, uh, when it relates to conservation, because it identifies the areas where shorebirds need to, uh, areas that are critical to them. And this is where what we used to put on are these data loggers. Now they've got MODIS and, and newer ways, but I love the way the map turns out and you can see how this uh, red knot comes up from very way down in Tierra del Fuego, goes up and, uh, you know, and to the breeding grounds and then goes back to its wintering area. So it just gives you an idea of the, the phenomenal journey that these, these birds are undertaking. And how many days, that's the other, 5,100 kilometers in eight days and across water. God, good grief. Okay, purple sandpiper is very a very rare northbound migrant in Ontario in the spring. And in fact, probably not, too, not a lot of Ontario birders even get the opportunity. So if, you, if there is one reported this spring, go and take a look at it and see it in its breeding plumage. Um, it might very well be in a harbor. This was at Coburg Harbor um, a few years ago, but they like rocky areas. Uh, phalaropes are the swimming sandpipers and um, the, because they do swim. So here we have Wilson's phalarope. Uh, the male is the, the dull one and the bright one is the female. So the sex roles are reversed and, um, and the plumages that, that go with those. Uh, so it's the male that is going to incubate and take care of the, uh, and going to help and go and raise the young. Um, redneck phalarope is, uh, this is probably also a male, nice and bright. This was actually in a flooded, uh, on a flooded construction site uh, near Point Pili um, several years ago. And so this is the comparison with the Wilson's phalarope, um, but it's all black and the rufus is on the neck here, uh, whereas the Wilson's phalarope has got you know, the gray coming over the top of the head. So if you see a phalarope, just, and you're not sure, just check your, you know, your guides and everything. And uh, redneck phalaropes are late migrants. They're going way um, north up into the, you know, Hudson Bay and, and Arctic farther up. Uh, Wilson's phalarope, a few do breed in Ontario in some sewage lagoons and, and, uh, places like that, but it's mostly a Western breeder. And here's um, a redneck phalarope. 
probably a male because it's a dull one and it's on, right on the breeding grounds. And um, it, they have amazing feet. Uh, they don't have feet like any other shorebird. They have lobed uh, toes with webbing between the toes lobed toes so those are these uh, funny uh, pattern markings here and it's because the rednecked and the red phalarope swim and they spend their winter actually uh, in the ocean at sea so they need an adaptation they need to be able to you know to swim uh, to, to move about in the water and that's their adaptation lobe toes uh, uh, a rare spectacular shorebird is the rough um, it's a shorebird that has co different color morphs here you have a, these are some of the ones that I've seen in Ontario so we have black uh, rufous red here and then this gorgeous golden one with with black um, and these are males and absolutely wonderful to see. Uh, courtesy of Lev Frid, this rough was in Brighton uh, several years ago. It's a, a white one and um, called a satellite, uh, probably a satellite rough, uh, but they have uh, very interesting mating systems. They, they uh, rough lek and of course males are always trying to find ways of sneaking in and um, and uh, mating with a female. So um, that's all part of their, their social structure, the, the color. This is um, another male that was um, uh, west of Highway 400 a couple of years ago. And I put this photo in to show the, the size with that and greater yellow legs. And a female ruff, totally different. Very, uh, you, could, you could almost pass it over um, as a pectoral sandpiper or, or you know, certainly it, uh, it's not dramatic like the males. Now we're almost at the end. We're coming to our quiz. We'll, we'll um, do these answers all together. You might want to just uh, shout them out to yourselves, of course, while you're watching. And here we have the first one. So it is uh, Dunlin. Again, just look at the shape and think about the shape of what we saw. And here we have greater yellow legs, the, the long bill with a slight upturn. Um, and this one here, well, you, that one's God, we, we can't really tell whether it's Hudsonian or marbled just by the, the, the shape of it. Then semi palmated plover, small, the small bill here. Dowager, one of the dowagers. Again, we're not sure which one. We, we, you can't. You know, it's a dowager, and that's when you then go to check all the ID points. And redneck phalarope by the more slender bill than the red phalarope. American avocet, pretty easy by the shape of the bill. And here you can almost see this one teetering. Spotted sandpiper. And which, what plover is this one? Thicker bill, that's a black belly plover. And the last one here, it's one of the peeps, one of the small sandpipers, but you definitely need to see more of the feather tracks to identify that. And so oh, what about some favorite spring shorebird hotspots? Well, um, definitely the tip of Point Peely is always uh, a place to be. And Hillman Shorebird Cell is absolutely amazing. And I'm very sorry that I'm here in Toronto uh, and not looking at shorebirds and running the OFO Shorebird Night, you know, or not running them, but helping with them um, at, Hillman, at Hillman Marsh. But uh, we're hoping to be back maybe closer to normal by next year. But I'm going to take advantage of all the fantastic habitat we have around Toronto uh, to find as many shorebirds as possible. Um, sewage lagoons are definitely a great place. Those retention ponds uh, near highways uh, are also uh, proving to be really good. Um, any harbors with, with those rocky um, sort of, uh, 
the jut out, uh, fantastic uh, for shorebirds. Or any beaches anywhere, uh, pebbled or sandy, doesn't matter. Mud flats anywhere on the Great Lakes. And with some low water levels on Lake Ontario, uh, it could create some good habitat. So rock jetties, uh, flooded fields, marshes, ponds, generally anything associated with, uh, with water, rocks, pebbles, mud, anything like that. Um, agricultural fields that are flooded can, can be fantastic. And um, maybe even if they're dry, probably not bad too. And again, another flooded uh, area, superb. Um, this is, it was in Toronto at Colonel Sam Smith Park when uh, a whole, just a huge flock of Dunlin just rested all day on the, these, the, the rocky um, support, sort of the protect, protecting the harbor. And Wimbrel, the same thing. And you saw Wimbrel on the beach earlier at Wheatley. Uh, beaches, Dar Darlington Provincial Park. Um, this is uh, Hillman Marsh again. Uh, sewage lagoons. This is Blenheim when the um, you know the sprinklers at the back were really, really, really good. Just huge flocks of shorebirds. So you can find your own. Uh, favorite areas, uh, find places that nobody else has found. And we just look forward. Uh, you feel strange putting up a, a photo like this because this is in our past, but we look forward to resuming as close to normal life, hopefully next year when we can get together. Uh, we may have to socially distance a little more than in this photo, but um, we're going to get there and we're going to see everybody. But uh, in spite of that, you can get out there and certainly enjoy uh, spring migration of shorebirds. If you need a little help, uh, there is a shorebird book uh, that I put together um, in 2015. Uh, all the proceeds go to the Matt Holder um, Fund for Environmental Education and uh, if you need the link, you can always uh, email me or Sarah and we'll get it to you if you're interested. Um, but uh, it outlines the bird, all each of the shorebirds, the regular shorebirds in breeding plumage, in uh, adults molting into winter plumage, and then the juvenile plumage. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoy spring shorebirding. I look forward to... Um, reading your sightings on eBird and uh, maybe on Facebook as well, wherever, but uh, please post, please let us know what you're seeing. And um, thank you very much for joining us this evening. I, I'm delighted to have uh, been doing this presentation for Point Pelee National Park and Ontario Field Ornithologist. So take care everybody and looking forward to seeing you soon. Yay, lots of applause from the audience, Jean. Um, I wanted to just, I'm going to really quickly pull up and show you the uh, Dunlin video one more time, just because oh, all right. it didn't play properly, so everybody gets a chance to see the cheeky Dunlins. <laughs> He's so cute, that guy. Yeah. definitely his little puddle and he was not going to share at all. Okay, so we have a couple minutes for questions if anyone has any questions. Somebody had asked about your shorebird book, Jean, so I'm glad you had that in at the end. Um, somebody had also asked about what's the best wind for Wimbrel? The best wind for Wimbrel is southeast wind because they're, um, they're coming up from the Virginia coast. And so if you look at the map, they are southeast of, of us. So a tailwind really helps. 
All right. Uh, some people were also asking, is has this presentation been recorded? The answer is a big yes. Um, you can come back on Facebook and watch it again if you want to, and we're also going to be uh, putting it up on our YouTube page in the next couple days. So if you need to come back and review anything, um, uh, you'll be able to come back to it and go through the sections again and, and see what you need to see um, from that perspective. So um, I'm just going to give it another minute or two and see if we have any other questions come up in the comments. And if we don't, we'll wrap it up for the evening. Great. So just lots and lots of thank yous. Um, oh, somebody is asking, were those rednecks stint in the video too? Uh, not in any video that I had. I wish they had been. No. <laughs> Which, um, in the um, sandaling video, maybe? Is that? They're, yeah. all, they're all North American shorebirds. Yeah. Uh, except the ones that I distinctly said are um, are not. Okay. Um, somebody is asking, is the white lower eyelid a good mark for a long-billed dowager? Um, it is, actually. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And somebody's asking, um, yes, we'll be putting a link up for the birding by ear on the Point Peely's uh, Facebook page. Uh, somebody's asking for any tips on Baird's sandpiper ID. Uh, Baird's, we get, we get very few in the, the spring. It's rare in the spring. I know it's um, so uh, it, it looks very similar to it has it, it looks very similar to white rump sandpiper in shape. It has a long wing extension, and uh, it's sand. It's a sort of sandy, um, pale pale shorebird. But if you have a shorebird that's got the long wing extension, that will maybe lead you to a Baird's. But it, they don't have that the streaking on the flanks. Um, somebody. Or the arrowheads. Asked a really good question. Why do so many um, go so far north? Why? Because the Arctic is opening up, and it's been it's been covered um, with snow and uh, over winter. So there's tons of food. Birds are going where there's food, and so as uh, the the tundra warms up, it is it's just full of uh, full of food. So it's worth it to them. They're exploiting an area uh, and, and there are not a lot of people up there so it, it really helps <laughs> um, no just very little disturbance although they they have to deal with predators but. yeah uh, someone's asking what is the best way to start learning about shorebirds um, I think my answer is to just go out and start looking at them I and, agree and watching yes. them um, and I think what's great about it too is you can go out and just watch a bunch of sanderlings on a beach and start learning about shorebirds and have a fairly easy and interesting experience. I remember sitting on the tip of Point Peely and I actually had a sanderling run across the top of my foot one time because um, they're, they're not, sh they were not shy at all. But I think um, getting out and just starting to look at them and take notes about what you're seeing and look at proportions and all of those things, um, I think are really great places to start. Best way, just get out there and start looking at things. And then come back and watch Jean's presentation again. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's asking, what shorebirds are we seeing in Toronto right now? Um, well, we had three Willets the other day. That was really exciting. Um, greater and lesser yellow legs still. And uh, one sandaling was reported from Tommy Thompson. Pectoral sandpipers. But the big... The, the big push of shorebirds is to come. So yeah. the, this presentation, Sarah picked the time. It's perfect time because we're some of the birds have already gone, like the ones that have got some of the ones going to the prairies because the prairies open up uh, for breeding much earlier than the Arctic. And so the northern ones are to come. And especially the last 10 days of May and early June, spectacular shorebirding. Okay. Uh, someone's asking for a recommendation for a park in Toronto that's good to see shorebirds. Well, Tommy Thompson, um, Colonel Sam are two uh, good ones. Well, Tommy Thompson, because they have a shorebird cell. And actually, the Lake, the Lake Ontario is coming back up again. But that, those are really good. Okay. Um, the, um, pers yeah. uh, the person who was asking about the stints, 
Um, it's the smaller birds that were in the Dunlin video. Okay. Oh, they those are semi-palmated sandpipers. So okay. the, all late ones going up to the, the high, going to up to the Arctic. Excellent. Um, somebody's That's asking. In the third week of May. Yeah. Where do you get notification of rarity occurrence? So um, there's a few places. There's um, if you go onto OFO's website, there's a great place. There's a section about finding out about birds. And in there, there's a whole bunch of places where you can find out about rare birds, whether it's through eBird or Discord or Listserv. So there's um, so just go to OFO.ca and then and then just look for where to find birds and you'll see where you can find all those um, rarities that are popping up in and around places. So, you know, when we had about 40 Avocet show up here about a week ago, that popped up on all of those notifications. So, all right, I think we've handled all of our questions. So sure. I'm gonna say another big thank you to Jean for coming out and, and talking about shorebirds. I know it, it was really hard. We had to twist your arm really hard to <laughs> get you to talk to us about shorebirds tonight, but we do really appreciate it. And yeah. like you, I look forward to hopefully uh, spring where we're all back out at the shorebird cell, uh, looking at some of these beautiful little gems. So thank you everyone for coming out tonight. I uh, just wanna make a couple other announcements. Um, with OFO, we have a couple great things coming up. On May 16th, um, we're gonna draw a bird again. So if you came out to draw a bird day on April 8th, we did a pileated woodpecker. I am gonna lead you through drawing a warbler on uh, Sunday the 16th on drawing day. So if you wanna come out, that'll be posted up there. Um, we also have a great little presentation that we're doing for the Toronto Bird Celebration uh, about birds we love to, birds that you love that other people hate. So we'll be doing a panel discussion about some of those birds and why we really do love them. And then also at the end of the month, uh, OFO is hosting the virtual Sault Ste. Marie Birding Festival. So if you want to find out more information, um, it's all up on the OFO webpage and also will be linked in events uh, shortly in the OFO uh, Facebook page as well. And we have a uh, hi to Jean here from Fred Bodsworth's family. Oh, that's oh, so, so that's so nice. Well, Fred Bodsworth, so that people know, who wrote the uh, very, uh, it's award-winning uh, novel, The um, the Last of the Curlews, and uh, the tragic story of the Eskimo Curlew. So that's really, really nice yeah. to hear. Fred, um, and I, I will say hi to Fred's family too, because... Uh, Fred was one of my favorites, and we always had a special little chat um, every spring when I saw him in May. Um, uh, his book meant a lot to me and my dad, so. Oh, that's great. All, All right. right. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. We'll see you again soon. Yes. And. I think all of us want to just get out and look at birds, and we're going to go find shorebirds tomorrow. So thanks, Jean. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Yeah, no. <laughs>